Davis, welcome to Validated. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah. Uh, I want to get into a bunch of stuff today. Uh, let's let's talk about games, games infrastructure. Um, we're talking in part because you guys uh, over at Sonal Labs a few months ago launched um, GameShift. So tell us a little bit about what GameShift actually is. Yeah, at a high level, GameShift is a single API service that helps games build on top of Solana. When we started uh, working on this project over a year ago, we just realized that it was still very difficult for any game developer that wanted to use Solana to get integrated with you know, all the basics that they would need, wallets and assets and payments, marketplaces. Um, there are great vendors that provide individual services, but we felt like there was nothing that tied that together in a really easy to consume package. So that's what GameShift is. Um, the way I like to describe it to games developers is that we're a blockchain backend service for the game. And this allows the developer to focus on their game uh, in the traditional infrastructure they normally use. And then on the backend, they integrate with us. and We provide all of those uh, features that they need to do anything they need on Solana. Yeah, so talk a little bit about like what that interface layer looks like. Because people have been building blockchain-based games for a while, but a lot of them have had to develop their own infrastructure to actually talk to the underlying blockchain. Yeah, we actually approach this a little bit different than some of the other solutions that have been in the market outside of Solana in the past. We take a very traditional approach in terms of how we deliver the product. So we're actually providing a REST-based API and what that means is we're essentially intermediating from the game uh, and the chain. So we're in between. It's a little bit different than other approaches that might connect the client directly on chain. Uh, there's a project in Solana called Magic Block that helps with that. And it's great for certain use cases. There's other approaches that orchestrate on chain deployment of programs on behalf of the game developer, but then the developer has to maintain their own keys and maintain control and management of all of those programs. That's a different approach that has its trade-offs. We picked this intermediated approach because we think it is the most simple approach for the average developer. Yeah, It requires the least amount of blockchain knowledge. It requires the least amount of key management, blockchain programming, Rust programming, any of that. And we really wanted to provide the greatest flexibility for ourselves to serve the existing Solana community of game developers, which are pretty facile when it comes to Solana. But we really wanted to be able to welcome game developers that are blockchain aware, blockchain interested, maybe on other chains. And then in the future, to really go convince traditional gaming studios to take blockchain seriously. And we think the way to do that is to give them an answer that looks very familiar to any other infrastructure they're using, say, for cloud services, or if they're using a payments provider, our interface is going to look very similar to that. Yeah, so so what are they in a traditional model without something like GameShift? What are developers having to actually build? And talk a little bit about how that abstraction layer actually makes it easier for a game developer to do something like mint an NFT or move a token. So if you're building a game today and you want to, I like your examples, um, you want to mint an NFT, the approach today is you, without any help from a vendor, you would have to go figure out how to use whatever the right NFT standard is. Um, as an aside, we can talk later about how standards get set in Solana, which is a little different than in other environments. Yeah. And so you'd have to decide, am I using the Metaplex NFT standard? Am I using Core? Am I using Compressed? Am I using PNFTs, XNFTs? Like these are all exists. These are all things. So first you have to go understand that. And uh, let's just say the documentation for some of these things is, is not great. So you have to go understand that figure out how to implement it, deploy the relevant programs, create all the accounts, et cetera. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to find your RPC provider. And so you're starting to get into a world where you need Rust development experience. You need to understand how the Solana blockchain works in the architecture. You need to find RPC providers in sort of this uh, on-chain, off-chain infrastructure. So that's one approach, right? Um, the other approach is you go find a vendor that can provide that particular service. So you might work with a Crossmint, for example, and that will be more of a traditional API approach. But that you go down that path and you solve for that particular need. And then let's say you get that done. Now you're now you're thinking, okay, well, now I'd like to go do a fungible token. Go yeah. repeat that entire process all over again. And then now you have a another implementation that sits alongside your NFTs and so on. Right. 
And so, like, how are people actually using this today? Like, what games are actually built on top of GameShift? Yeah, so we have a couple of games I could uh, talk about. So the first would be Earth from Another Sun, which is a galactic looter shooter RPG game. They've been working on the game for about two and a half years before they started doing the blockchain integration. Just a quick background. This is a team that comes from AAA Gaming. They've been focused on building an amazing game. They always knew they wanted to put blockchain in somewhere. And when they got to that point, they looked around, they decided they wanted to be on Solana. They came to us. And so now they're integrating with us. They're using a whole host of features with us. So they're going to do token incentives with GameShift. Uh, they'll have a token for the game. They It's a RPG, so it's a resource uh, economy. So they're going to mint and manage all of their resources, both semi-fungibles and non-fungible uh, tokens representing their resources with us. They're going to be doing crafting, marketplaces. They're going to connect all that through to fiat payments. And so like their work of actually integrating this, what did this look like using GameShift versus if they'd done it um, natively or if they'd gone and actually had no Web3 component to this at all? So with us, you know, they come and, and they worked with us to come up with their integration design. In terms of actually building with us, it looked like start with the re user registration API, and then you just start plugging everything in after that. Yeah. It's all designed to work really nicely together, um, as you would expect out of a Stripe or anything like this. Uh, they could have gone down one of these other paths we've talked about before. Uh, they were looking at, do we hire one or two additional engineers just to do the blockchain integration? And for an early stage games team, that's a huge amount of spend. It's also a huge amount of distraction away from the core game which this team is really focused on because they're really wanting to build a high quality gaming experience first and foremost. So for them, spending more resources and time on the blockchain integration internally would actually distract from what mm. they're trying to build. So for teams like that that are sort of trying to decide, oh, what blockchain do I build a game on? How are they going about making that decision and how did these guys end up choosing Solana? I think for games teams, what they're looking at that's most important uh, in, in the blockchain choice is technology. It's the potential to acquire players. It's the broader eco set of ecosystem activities that are going on. And then the, the fourth is what types of integration partners they can find that makes the job easier. Yeah. To go back through those, so on the technology side, it comes down to a lot of things that we know being deeply in Solana, right? Transaction speed, block times, throughput. I think Solana's head and like it's a very easy comparison to make with Solana. Like that one's pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, then it comes down to how big is the player base in the ecosystem? Games are looking towards blockchains as sort of de facto distribution channels. They, they sort of think that if they can get into the ecosystem, that players will discover them more easily. Um, I don't know how true that is, but that's the belief that's out there. And then, Beyond that, there's the question of, well, what is the broader set of economic activities or user activities that are going on in this ecosystem? I think by way of example, what's really exciting about Solana that teams are definitely interested in working in is you think about gaming and what are the adjacencies alongside gaming. DeFi is certainly one for a certain set of players and game types. And so having a robust DeFi ecosystem is actually helpful for a game that wants to plug into that kind of player mentality or that kind of infrastructure. So if token trading is part of the game, that's a very natural adjacency. The other adjacency that has become really popular in the last, call it six, 12 months, is the meme coin world. Hmm. And meme coins are sort of pure in their use case that they are kind of games in and of themselves. And so I see a lot of teams looking at Solana and getting excited about the opportunity to work with those meme, meme coin communities and provide new activities around that meme coin. And in a way, this is extremely complementary. Um, sorry, to take a quick aside on this point, because I think it's actually really important. When I first got into crypto a number of years ago, this is when we still had this narrative of game asset interoperability, which yeah. I, frankly, we just haven't seen. That hasn't, that hasn't evolved. And I think for some very good business reasons, that hasn't happened. And I, I don't know that it will. Meme coins are different, though. Because a meme coin, once it gets past that initial hump of adoption, that that team is welcoming of any other 
uh, opportunities to drive value and excitement around the token. And so in the case of a Bonk or a WIF, having games come into Solana and give Bonk holders, WIF holders an opportunity to do something in that game with their token, with other token holders, this is a great complement. And so I think there's a great, a, a, a growing opportunity for meme coins and games to work more together. And so that's sort of the community aspect of like all of the other things that are going on in Solana or on chain that do motivate games teams in their choice. So the sort of community into game like flow and funnel was something that a lot of the NFT projects thought they were going to be able to build back in 21 or 22. But I think what we saw is like very, very few NFT projects that set out to build a game actually ended up building anything that we really call a game. So why do you think there's like a more natural fit there between meme coins and sort of what was tried last cycle? Yeah. Well, a number of things come to mind. So in no particular order, first with the NFT communities, you know, those were often minted with like a 10K mint yeah, or whatever the number is. And so you're sort of limited from the get-go as to the distribution of your community, how big it can be. So you get people that go to the mint and they buy 10 or 100 or 200 of these things. So you ultimately, only, you ultimately only have so many holders that can actually do things. So that's one problem. Yeah. I think the other is the NFT communities, in order for an NFT to really turn into a game, that's a big leap in terms of developing all of the content, the lore around whatever that original NFT was built on. And so you have to do a lot more to take an NFT into a game than to sort of harness the excitement around a meme coin and sort of give those holders something to do with it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the third is meme coins, because they have bigger distribution, and maybe this is also a timing aspect because the NFTs into games is kind of a narrative from a couple of years ago, and here we are now. But I think with the greater distribution in meme coins, and the fact that kind of the fun of the meme coins is the trading and is the price. Like that's it's that's the points of the game of meme coins. Yeah. Right. Um, I think there's just a lot more energy around them than I saw with some of these smaller NFT communities that have these ideas about becoming games. And maybe the last point is like the way you frame the question, I actually think is worth coming back to, which is some of these NFT communities said we're gonna do this mint and then we're going to build a game around it. I don't think any of the meme coins ever said that. And I don't think that that's yeah. largely what their strategy is. What I see are games coming in and we have a couple of games we're working with right now that are building say tournament features where you can compete with other players, but you compete under the banner of your chosen meme coin. And then you could do all these like really cool dynamics of like, if you're playing for whiff and I'm playing for bonk and I win, I get your whiff and I automatically sell it and then buy Bonk. So my winning in the game against you creates sell pressure on Whiff and buy pressure on Bonk. Yeah. And that's just plays into like the game of the meme coins. Right. So uh, blockchain games are sort of something that's been talked about for probably four or five years at this point as an industry that's kind of about to, to break open. And it always feels like there's like one or two things missing and that's sort of been the narrative over the last few years. So like, wh where actually are we in the sort of breakout game cycle moment we kind of keep being told is coming soon? Um, and why do you think it has sort of not happened yet? So I, for me, it comes back to sort of game quality. And actually, before I even say that, it's probably worth um, segmenting a little bit. I think there have been successes in Web3 gaming for Web3 players. It's a small niche, right? Games that are more trading oriented can be successful and have been successful, but it's just not been in a scale that's gotten the attention outside of Web3. Yeah. Right? And I think even folks that are in Web3, they're looking at that and they see those things as sort of trading games, not as games. Yeah. And so that's really the point here is, we're still waiting for the quality games to come that are built as fun games first and then successfully leverage Web3 infrastructure for their asset economy or for something interesting around tournaments or payments and some of the other things that we see that are really nascent in like user-generated content or on-chain gaming. Um, there was a big investment cycle in games uh, in 2021, 2022, yeah. and sorry, at the beginning of 23, for a team like 
going back to Earth from another sun, this is a team that has been that has been funded for a couple of years. They've been building for a couple of years. That's the that's the scale on which you have to uh, invest and build these kinds of really high quality games. And so I think it's a matter of seeing some of those projects launch, which is supposed to be happening this year. EFAS, for example, is coming in Q3, Q4. Um, we've seen a number of other names like Jungle just announced they're coming to Solana. I think that's an exciting uh, project. Parallel is coming to Solana. That's an interesting project that has some success. So I think it starts with that game quality first. But then the second thing that these teams need to demonstrate is sustainability around the on-chain components. Yeah. One of the things I see changing is six months ago, teams were rushing to launch tokens. Teams that we're working with now, they're starting to experiment with more um, uh, ring-fenced economies in the game that they will open over time as they feel confident they can manage those economies. Mm. So I think we may see games get a little bit slower in how they put things on chain in order to avoid you know, the boom and bust that we've seen in the past. Because once one of the, once that cycle happens for your game, you're kind of done, right? Yeah. And so you have to be super careful in, in rolling out the Web3 component of at least like the on-chain price discovery, liquidity, et cetera, around your game assets. Yeah. So with game shifts and other tools that exist today, like what dynamics and what type of games are, are kind of easiest or best to build on blockchain today? And what are the classes of games that maybe the tooling isn't quite there yet? So I think today th there's a whole host of games that probably don't make sense to do anything on chain. Probably a lot of single player games, just it's a little harder to see. So first and foremost, I think you have to look at games that are trying to do something. They're either a multiplayer game, or I do think that we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of development in the tournament real money gaming space where mm. you can take single player games and you can actually kind of create a multiplayer experience. But multiplayer, some element of multiplayer probably has to happen. So far, Web3 has demonstrated that any, any game with a rich asset economy makes sense to do on-chain. So RPGs are really good for this. I think on the other end of the spectrum, where we're still waiting for more technology potentially, would be getting more towards fully on-chain games. I do think that an on-chain game, meaning where you're putting your full game state and game logic on-chain, you have no back-end game server, or if you do, it's 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 not the authoritative source of truth. Yeah. I do think that opens some very interesting use cases, particularly around guilds and around sort of open modding. That's a very exciting space, but frankly, even Solana probably doesn't have the technicals out of the box that are necessary to fully enable those kinds of games. You look at Star Atlas fully on chain game in Solana, I think, uh, I don't know the stats off the top of my head, but I think uh, six months ago, they represented something like, I want to say 20% of all transaction volume. I mean, if, so if you have five-star atlases, you crash Solana. So we need to get beyond that. Um, there's some interesting projects in Solana. I don't know if you want to call them L2s or side chains that may solve some of this, but there's a whole host of infrastructure that if, if we really want to move into on-chain games, that has to get built. Those are, I think, are the two ends of the spectrum. The space is in the middle, right? We're starting to work our way, you know, across that space. But the ends of the spectrum, I think, really exemplify like what really can work easily and what's really you know, still needs a lot more development. Yeah. Does something like GameShift like work with the onboarding component too, or is it really just interfaces with like the blockchain for calls? Um, onboarding of whom? Uh, user side of. So like I sign up to use a game. Uh, there's a whole process of having to create wallets and other types of infrastructure to support that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we build in embedded wallets. So uh, our approach to this is kind of like a Stripe for Solana in the sense that mm. we support games bringing players that maybe already have wallets, so we can connect to existing wallets. But then we also support embedded wallets. We work with a company called MetaKeep, which is in the Solana ecosystem, uh, to provide embedded wallets. So uh, the game can sign a user up and provision a wallet silently for that user. And then later, when it's time for that user to approve a transaction, these are non-custodial wallets. There is a web-based flow for them to approve where the security and non-custodial nature is preserved through the way that uh, MetaKeep has implemented the approval uh, approval flow. And I think for us, when we think about on it's not just onboarding, it's the whole player experience where some games want to make that player experience very accessible for many different kinds of players. And so one way we do that, it's not just 
the embedded wallets, but we also support fiat payments, both on the pay in and pay out side. Mm. We connect that through on the marketplaces. So we do in game branded marketplaces with fiat purchasing built in. So you can buy assets off the marketplace using a credit card if you want. And I think that resonates with, with a lot of teams that really want to, out of the gate, be able to serve as many players as they can. At the end of the day, gaming is a hyper-competitive market. And I think the teams that can be successful, the ones that come in with an understanding of the demographic they're going after. And I don't know that that demographic is, is ultimately necessarily going to be like, I just want to serve, you know, web three players or, or web two players. I think it's going to be more about, Hey, my game is attracted to this kind of gamer. And that's the kind of person I want to serve. Okay. So I'm going to go find those people. You know, it's people that are interested in a certain type of RPG or people that are interested in this kind of a trading card game. And so I'm going to go into those communities where people are congregating around that genre, not around web three or web two. And I'm going to deploy my game. And as they come in, if they want to do the full Web3 experience, connect a wallet, pay with soul, whatever that is, I, GameShift can help them support that. Same time, if that player comes in without any of that stuff, then we can support that player as well. Yeah. So GameShift is your, your typical, uh, let's call it for-profit SaaS-style product. Um, out of all of the scope of things that Sun Labs could have chosen to build, what was it about this market and this, this product opportunity um, that was worth building out a whole product suite for? I think it started with a philosophy and a belief around games as a core use case for Web3. When we talk about games that have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of players transacting globally with assets of value, that really makes sense to do on chain. Doing that in the Web2 domain, I come, you know, some of my background has been in payments, right? You just do payments is incredibly complicated, let alone everything else you have to do, you know, for marketplaces, et cetera. So it started with a thesis and a belief that this is a great use case for not just blockchain, but specifically for Solana, right? We're Solana Labs, so we're going to look first and foremost, okay, like what, what is Solana predisposed for and what can we do well? Um, so that's really what drove the development here. And then the next step was to look at, well, is the, is the ecosystem well served with infrastructure providers today. Yeah. And what we identified was there was good vertical providers that could do, say, payments, that could do a marketplace, that could do wallets, but no one was really tying those all together and deploying a full package and then committing to expanding that package over time in the way that we have. So that was sort of the gap that we identified. And to your point, um, Salon Labs is a for-profit company. GameShift is a for-profit company. So we are also looking at you know, is this a space where we can add enough value that there's a revenue potential for the product? And we think that we're unlocking a lot of value, you know, with teams that come in, as I said, they can avoid hiring a full-time developer just for blockchain. That's a huge amount of savings, uh, plus the opportunity that then we sort of become their web three um, consultant, if you were, right. where, we're keep, where we're keeping tabs on everything that's happening in Solana. I think as labs, we're well positioned to do that, um, just given our history and the people we have on the team. We're keeping tabs on everything that's going on, and we're building into the product over time what we think are the most interesting Web3 enabled use cases. So just by way of example, we're working on real money gaming and tournament management now. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time with you know foundation and folks in the gaming space talking about Hey, what's the role of uh, Solana Actions and Blinks? You know, how do we use those in yeah. games? Are there some interesting use cases? And Token Twenty Two, right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of opportunities there. How much of those apply to games? And so, as we identify those, test them, then we'll bring them into the product. So, the the sort of thing you've been describing here of like there, there's a there's a product need here that wasn't being served kind of in the market. Um, what sort of convinced you that there was? a big market for this, though? Because I think probably a few years ago, there were a bunch of game infrastructure companies across many different blockchains that were getting built, and none of them really caught on at the time. So what what changed between the market of 2021 and the market of 2023 that something like GameShift was needed? So I think the difference from 21 to 23 is the breadth of what people were trying to do or even what was theoretically possible for Web3 and gaming. 2021, I mean, that was still like basically DeFi summer, NFT summer. That yeah. was the focus. And so 
the set of features that you could provide for it from an infrastructure perspective was pretty narrow. And frankly, I think at that time, those features would have been, I mean, even at that time, were commodities, right? NFT minting is not the most um, difficult sort of value add thing to provide. It's important and it's not trivial, right? but it becomes commoditized pretty quickly. And if you don't have a breadth of things you can go do, then you can't provide this better together value. You can't continue to expand the breadth of your services. So I think that that's a major difference where now we've got better infra- we have better infrastructure uh, around you know payments. We have many different asset types. Some of the things I mentioned about like tournaments, real money gaming. So there's more that you can do here where there's a bigger space for someone like us to provide value. I think the other thing that has changed is the narrative around gaming, and I think what the ecosystem is expecting out of gaming has evolved beyond those first experiments, that, which were very um, NFT-based, that were very play-to-earn based. Mm-hmm. And we've seen people trying many different types of economic models in gaming, some that use tokens, some that don't, uh, some that are more focused on competitive aspects, some that aren't. And so there's hopefully more opportunities to find what really works and then scale up from there. Admittedly, Web3 Gaming as a percentage of overall gaming is roughly 1%, right? And in a sense, that is both the opportunity, but it's also leads to the question of, of well, when that we talked about earlier. Yeah. We happen to have a belief that this, that this will connect for us and for the teams we work with. The question is, okay, how do we maximize the amount of time that we have and how do we take as many shots on goal to figure out what those things are going to be. Yeah. So the teams that are are coming to you now and saying, hey, we want to use this, we want to build this stuff on Solana, wh- what is the, that those conversations like? Is this sort of more of a, are they approaching you saying, we don't really know much about blockchain, but we want to have some blockchain component to this game, so we want to use this tooling? Or are these folks who are saying, hey, we've pretty much already decided we're going to build on Solana, but this just makes it easier for us to do something we were already going to do? It's a mix. I haven't, teams that come to us, you know, they, they, if they come to us, they found us because they at least knew enough about blockchain to understand that, hey, there's this thing called Solana, you know, so on. So we don't really run into teams that are saying, hey, uh, we don't know anything about blockchain, but let, like, let's work together. Right. Yeah. So there's always some degree of awareness. I think from there, it, it spans a spectrum. Um, there's two dimensions here. There's what do they want to do on chain? And then the question is, how do they want to do it? I think the how do they want to do it, we talked about earlier, you know, they are looking at options and they see how game shift fits relative to say, hey, I'm going to build my own or I'm going to go put together a bunch of vendors. So so there's a, that's like, I think, pretty clear to get through. Um, the variation in what we see of what people want to do on chain, I think that the bookends would be on one end, you have teams that come and they're looking at uh, taking a game model and bringing the sort of asset aspects of the game on chain. So RPGs are a nice example where it's yeah. pretty clear how you take an RPG from Web 2 to Web 3. We run into some just great teams to work with. Um, there's some names I wish I could share that we haven't announced yet, but there's a couple of teams that we're working with that are coming more from the Web 3 background. And they're very fun to work with because they're really thinking about how do they take some like the true Web3 degeneracy that happens around tokens and bring that into a game. Mm. And I think it's it's just fun to ideate on, on those initiatives because it just represents a different way of playing games that just kind of breaks the mold. And so that can be very fun. Beyond that, we do occasionally talk to teams that ultimately decide to go and build their own because they want to do a lot of custom stuff on chain. And, and I think that's super important because those are the teams that then we follow to figure out, okay, well, what more should we be building, right? We, um, yeah. through through that process, we identified, hey, we need to have an on-chain rewards program that can reward players for committing tokens over time. And then, you know, they do things in game and, and with all of that combined, they get access to rewards in game or on-chain. And we identified that because we saw that happening in a lot of games. So those teams that are outside the scope of game shift because they want to build their own, because they want something more complex, those become the people we follow and we watch and we look for inspiration from. Nice. And the actual like components themselves, um, 
you mentioned that this sort of handles the entire process of token management, item creation, um, mm -hmm. some of that kind of work where people are bringing their own wallets or connecting into embedded wallets. What is the sort of like future scope of what GameShift looks to touch look like? Is this the sort of thing where you actually could see other types of blockchain-specific tooling needed for enabling other types of game use cases? So there's a couple of things. I have mentioned uh, tournaments and real money gaming. I think that's a natural use case for Web3 because anytime we're talking about moving value around globally, it, you really have to, it's really like typically a natural fit for yeah. this technology. So managing a real money tournament, entry fees, prize pools, commissions, all that kind of stuff, doing that on chain is a natural fit for, for not just like the infrastructure, but also for some of the players that are in the space, right? Um, if they're going from like trading meme coins, it's pretty natural for them to also you know, throw a couple of dollars in to play a game. So that's one. Uh, beyond that, as I mentioned, we're looking at things like Blinks and Token 22. That's more technical driven. There are opportunities to use those technologies for more user acquisition. So like Blinks is potentially an interesting way to go out and acquire players and really kind of break the silo between a game and the rest of the world by kind of putting that blink that can render on a different platform. Beyond that, some of the things that we're looking at come more from the, what some of the teams are doing on chain. So what happens if you do publish your player profile, your leaderboards, that sort of thing on chain? This is more sort of research oriented for us, but gets into the gets into the spaces of player identity and reputation, mm. potentially some distribution potential, open modding, that kind of thing. So you mentioned something interesting there, which are like money based games, which gets a little bit closer to betting than the traditional blockchain games market's been in. But obviously, sports betting and other types of you know online gambling are are quite profitable and you know dominate the real world of uh, sports as well. So do you see this as an area of expansion for, for game shift tooling as well for those type of uh, more overtly financial games? Potentially. So I think in the space of real money games, there's, in my mind, roughly speaking, there's three major categories. There's single player games of skill. So this is like what skills builds. It's a whole company that builds this stuff. Uh, then in the middle, which is where we're focused, would be more competitive multiplayer games that are using real money as either esports, more traditional, you know, uh, rewarding really skilled players with lots of value. I think there's a lot of interesting opportunity of lower dollar or lower value uh, games that really just engage the lizard part of the brain once you have a little bit of money on the line. Yeah. And then to your point, there's this third category that gets into the traditional notion of gaming, which is sometimes referred to as gambling. That's a space that we may get into. It's very early to say because of the regulatory exposure that's there. There are, at least it's fortunate to be able to say this, being in Web3, there are clear regulations in that space, yeah. right? Unlike what we do in, in Web3 normally, there are clear regulations in that space. In some places, it's easier to do than others. So we'll sort of take that on a case-by-case -case basis. But right now, we really want to get that middle category launched. And I think there's a real opportunity to prove out what you can do when you're talking about having players engage in a multiplayer game with, you know, 50 cents with a dollar worth of value on the line, where it's not about the money, but it's about the money sort of triggering this emotional response to the game. Yeah. That just makes it much more engrossing. I think it's a whole that's a whole space that's underexplored. I'm really excited to see mm -hmm. what happens in the space and then obviously what we can do to power that. So over the last year or so, we've seen a huge amount more interest from institutions in building financial products on uh, blockchain and Solana in general, whether that's the launch of new stable coins, real world assets, large financial institutions deciding to build on the network. That's been like a really big uh, new trend over the last probably 12 months or so. How are you seeing uh, more traditional game companies look at blockchain? Is the sort of excitement of 2022 back or are we still waiting for them to kind of pivot back into blockchain? I think we're still waiting and I think they're still waiting. Yeah. What, what, I've, what I hear when I talk to those companies is it, on, on the positive side, those conversations are more welcomed than they were, say, a year or two years ago. Yeah. These traditional studios 
are open to having the conversation to talking about Web3. They, they don't shut the door on you like they did a year ago, like post FTX. Um, but very clearly, they're still saying, hey, we need to see something work at, sc- at, at a big enough scale that it starts to make sense for us. I think it's important to understand that the overall gaming industry has been in a bit of state of retro of introspection over the last couple of years hmm. was this COVID boom in gaming, right? We were all locked up and game the gaming industry did great for a couple of years, but then everyone started to get back out, touching grass, seeing humans again. And there's been a bit of retent- retrenchment in the gaming industry. Hmm. I think so far this year has been, I want to say 100,000 or more layoffs in the gaming industry. Uh, and so what's happening, I think, with these more traditional studios is they're pulling back they're focusing on the core of what has worked, both from a game dynamic, IP, user acquisition, go to market. And they're really just kind of focused on what's working and trying to figure out what they're going to do next. And so for the where Web3 fits into that conversation, they're completely open to anything, including Web3, that shows them a path forward to increasing revenue, in- increasing revenue per player, increasing uh, player engagement stats, et cetera. But they need to see it happen at a big enough scale that they can imagine scaling it up to where they're yeah. at. I mean, we're talking about larger gaming studios here. Um, and so a game that's successful with 10,000 MAUs or 20,000 MAUs is probably not a big enough scale to get the attention of, of really anyone in that space. I'm thinking that they're going to need to see sustained like 100,000, 250, 500,000 MAUs before they'll look at something as a potential template for what they can do. Uh, when we can get there, there's potentially a big unlock because then maybe we get access to a whole bunch of IP that these games, uh, these game studios could just continue to kind of wash, rinse, repeat. And maybe there's a really cool opportunity to layer in Web3 with some of that awesome IP. And maybe that then becomes really the next step function of Web3 enabled gaming. Yeah. Well, if uh, folks are interested in learning more about Game Shift or building on it, where can they go to find out some more info? Sure. Yeah. So the best place would be our website, gameshift.dev. You can follow us on uh, on X at gameshift.dev. You can also get some updates from Solana Labs occasionally. And in any of those services, you can find ways to reach out to us. We've got email, we've got Telegram. Um, we're always happy to talk to game studios uh, and just find out, just always interested to see what people are building and always happy to help. Nice. Well, Davis, thanks for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Austin. Awesome.